Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we're talking to Dr. Katherine Greenberg. Katie is a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station. Hi Katie, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you, thanks for having me. Oh yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you because you've been involved in a lot of research that is not only longer term in nature, but also looks at a bunch of different types of animals. And that kind of research is in some ways unique, or at least not the norm, because most research projects really only last for a couple of years, and they focus on one or two species, or maybe one or two taxa, or groups of animals. And those projects are really important. I'm not putting them down at all, because that's the way we learn a lot of things. And that's, in fact, the research that I've done in the past as well. But they also only tell part of the story we're not working in a vacuum, we're not living in a vacuum. So what might help one species may not have the same impacts on another species. And what happens in the short term isn't necessarily what happens in the longer term. So having these longer term, broader aspect research projects is also really, really important and helps to add to that story and our knowledge and our ability to apply that knowledge. So I'm sure this conversation is going to go in lots of different directions, but before we really dive into that, let's take a couple of minutes and just tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, well, I'm a research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station, and my focus is on researching forest disturbances. Uh, Those could be natural disturbances like wind disturbance or wildfire but also silvicultural disturbances, which is basically forest management, such as prescribed burning or timber harvesting and that sort of thing, and how those actions or events affect animals. And I like to look, as you said, not at one taxa, although I do think it's important to drill down, especially in some cases, but I like to look at whole communities of animals to see what the effects of these disturbances are on bird communities or reptile and amphibian communities and so on. And that way I get a broader perspective because as you said, most forest actions or natural events aren't gonna have the same effect on everything. So some species might respond positively and some not so positively. And so I like to see the whole picture. That's awesome. I can't wait to dig into some of this with you. I've looked at some of your research already. So I've got a little bit of a background, but can't wait to dig in deeper with it, drill down a little bit deeper, and then also share that with our listeners, because I think it's something that many of our listeners are going to be very interested in. And much of your research, as I understand it, has really focused on oaks and their importance. And that makes sense because being in the eastern part of the U.S. and especially the southern part of the U.S., we have traditionally a heavy oak hickory component to our forests, especially our deciduous forests. And our oak hickory forests have really changed a lot in the last several decades in many areas. And I think part of that goes back to a lot of what you were talking about was those disturbance factors being taken away in many aspects. So for our listeners who may not be familiar, Oaks and hickories are considered shade intolerant species of trees, which simply means that they need a lot of sunlight in order to grow. So as our forest canopies close in and those disturbance actions aren't happening, it becomes much more shady. The oak hickory seedlings have a harder time growing and other trees like maples and beeches that are much more shade tolerant, which means they tend to grow in shadier conditions, are able to grow up as those original oak hickories die, what's left to replace them are those maples and beeches. And that's what I'm seeing a lot in my woods on our property as well. There hasn't been much logging or disturbance on it 
and many decades. And now we've got a few oaks, some hickories, but primarily moving more into that maple beach component. A lot of tulip poplars just because of where I live as well, but really losing out on those oaks. So we're looking at ways to disturb and manage our own property to get some of those oaks back and really bring in that oak component again, because oaks are so important on so many different levels. But yeah, one of those things that I wanted to talk to you about is just finding out more about some of that research that you've done with looking at those disturbance factors. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Actually, I'm not a research forester. I'm a research ecologist that Mm -hmm. focuses on wildlife. And most of my research has not been on regeneration. It's been on acorn production. Uh, Most of my oak research has been. I've done a lot of other things besides oaks within the oak oak hickory dominated ecosystem, of course. Um, I could tell you a little bit just because I've been around a lot of research foresters and done a lot of reading on it, but I can't tell you authoritatively you know, recommend how to regenerate oaks. But I can tell you that oak trees are mid-tolerant in shade. So in order to reproduce successfully or have successful regeneration, which means not just have seedlings on the forest floor, but grow up into the forest canopy and replace themselves as others die, they need to be able to first grow to a larger size. So not just have seedlings on the forest floor, but have advanced regeneration, it's called, which is kind of sapling sized trees. And then after they're already that size, they need to have a disturbance that opens the canopy. And that way they might have a fighting chance to compete with other faster growing species like yellow poplar, especially in our area, which is a very fast growing species that once it's released, seedlings grow really fast and almost always beat. It's like the tortoise and the hare. Mm -hmm. So the key is, um, you know, how do you get them into the canopy? And the, the reason they're probably not regenerating now as they used to is, is probably because there are disturbances lacking now that were once present. And also because of our land use history where, you know, there was a lot of selection cutting and burning and logging and all kinds of things. And before that, Native Americans burned all the time. And then after that, settlers burned all the time and let their animals graze in the woods and wanted the woods to remain a little bit open. And they did that by burning. So there's a lot of disturbances, mostly human caused disturbances back then that are now absent now. And that might be part of the reason that we're not seeing the natural oak regeneration process happening in many places. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the oaks and the acorns because that's that's one of the really big areas I wanted to kind of drill down and and talk about more was those oaks and the acorns because as a wildlife biologist by training, I know how important oaks and acorns are to so many different types of animals, whether it's the acorns themselves, whether it's the habitat and shelter that the oak trees can provide, the insects that eat the oaks and therefore feed further up the food chain. I mean, oaks are just so important on so many different levels and especially those acorns as a food crop for themselves. So anybody that's really in wildlife biology, ecology in the Eastern US at least has a good general understanding of that usually. Hunters, whether they're turkey hunters, squirrel hunters, deer hunters, they always kind of known how important oaks can be for those game species. I think the general public who's interested in nature and ecology and wildlife is really becoming much more, much more knowledgeable about how important oak trees are as well, based on some of Doug Talamay's work and other information that's out there. So yes, oaks are really, really important. And you've done a lot of work on some of that acorns and food sources. I know one of your projects is looking at how quickly acorns were removed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, First, let me expand on what you were saying, which is how important acorns are to wildlife. You're right. Hunters are generally very interested in acorn production because a lot of game species eat acorns. But also acorns are considered a keystone forest species because 
Mice, squirrels, chipmunks, all kinds of smaller animals also eat acorns. And then those animals are prey to other animals that are higher up in the food chain, like foxes and bobcats and hawks and things like that. So they're actually, acorns are pretty fundamental to the whole ecosystem. And that's one reason that there have been a lot of questions on how, you know, how oaks produce acorns. And one of the reasons people get concerned is because acorn crop sizes tend to be very erratic. So some years it's a really good crop, other years it's not such a good crop, some years it's moderate. And there are a lot of people say that, you know, oaks exhibit masting behavior, which means boom and bust production. But in fact, they, they do have boom years and they certainly have bust years, but there are also a lot of moderate years. So it's really not a clear cut pattern. And it's very hard to identify what causes, you know, good production in some years and not so good production in others. People have been searching for that question for a long time. It might be a combination of genetics, weather, drought, early spring rains that might dampen the pollination process because oaks pollinate by wind. So rain, a lot of rain could maybe dampen that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people wanna know, you know, how can they predict acorn production? How can they measure acorn production and so on? Um, but as far as the importance to wildlife, I've done one little study on that and that was looking at how fast acorns are removed from exclosures. So I set up exclosures, which means I put acorns into these small exclosures that were designed to allow only mice in, then others that were designed to let in slightly larger animals like squirrels and blue jays, and then others that were out in the open that could allow deer and any other sized animal. And I put white oak acorns and red oak acorns into those exclosures. And what we found is pretty much by, you know, within a year or really very quickly, a lot of, a lot of acorns were removed of both kinds, the red oak and the white oak. The reason I was interested in red oak versus white oak is a lot of people say that animals prefer the white oak mm -hmm. acorns because they have less tannins and therefore they're less bitter and the red oaks are less preferred. But what we found is that all the acorns were removed at similar rates. What we couldn't tell is whether the animals were eating the white oak acorns and storing the red oak acorns because we couldn't follow the acorn fate after they were removed, but we could tell they were re removed at similar rates. Yes, and that's something that's always interesting and always a topic of conversation if you're talking about acorn use by animals is white oaks versus red oaks and which ones are sweeter and yes, I've heard that so often as well. Yes. And that's interesting that they were removed equally um, mm -hmm. as quickly and they were all removed. So another thing that I thought landowners might be interested in is I've done a long term study um, of acorn production in mature forests where all the trees are densely packed, just like in any woods compared to shelter wood harvests where they left a lot of oaks, but they were all open grown because most of the trees have been removed around them. So their crowns were fully exposed to the sunlight. And this was like a 17 year study. And what we found was the oak trees, and this is general because it didn't necessarily apply to every species of oak or whatever, but in general, total species combined, we found that the oak trees in the shelter wood harvest that had their crowns exposed to the sun uh, produced way more acorns per tree than the ones in the mature forest where the tree crowns were pretty shaded on both sides. Um, so that had a lot of implications for forest managers, and it corroborates other studies that have found similar uh, results. That if you cut, uh, if you leave like 20 or 40 oak trees per hectare in a shelter wood harvest, you'll get just about as many acorns, like just about like 50 to 100 percent of the acorns that you would in a fully stocked stand next door. So that's of interest because what you're doing is you're, you're able to take out some of the oaks and do the multiple use management, such as timber harvesting and creating open habitats for other animals, but you still could retain a lot of the acorn production in these shelter wood harvests if you leave mature oaks, you know, because they're going to produce more acorns per crown. Which, yes, is very interesting if you're trying to get maximum acorn production. 
And that's what a lot of people are looking at. But then you also have the, when you're having those shelter wood cuts, that's usually producing more early to mid successional habitat, more open brushy areas, which it can be very different than the closed canopy forest in the species that use that, which in either way is better or worse. It's just, they're different types of habitat. And so in some cases you might have similar species using them. Some cases you might have different species using them. Yes, and that's actually what I've done a lot of my work on is what happens to the animal communities when you open up the canopy, whether it's open by a severe wind disturbance or a high severity wind disturbance or a high severity burn, wildfire or accidental prescribed fire <laughs> that gets a little bit too hot or whether it's through timber harvesting, um, you see a lot of similar responses by animals to any way, regardless of how that canopy is substantially reduced. If it's substantially reduced, um, what I have seen through multiple studies is that the animal communities tend to respond similarly to that canopy opening. And what you find is when you substantially open the canopy in upland hardwood forests, you're gonna get an open canopy forest with thick, thick shrub undergrowth at first, and a lot of tree regeneration, whether it's oak, which it probably won't be so much, or the oaks will be there, but other things might win the race as we just spoke about. And um, so, but you're gonna get uh, this open area with thick cover that lasts for several years before eventually those saplings grow up and shade it out and it becomes really a young forest with, it's a very dense young forest with lots of saplings for a long time. It takes many years before it, you know, like 80 years or 70 years or something like that before it looks like the forest that we see as we do our mountain biking through the forest now. Um, mm -hmm. But it's that initial stage that lasts for maybe eight years, something like that five to 10 years at the most in our area because our forests grow back very quickly before, oh, they yes. become, before they become not early successional habitats as you might call them. And what you see in that initial time frame when they're still open is a huge influx of breeding birds. I mostly focused on breeding birds, which means during the summer when they're nesting, not so much during the fall and winter and spring when they leave. But what you find is a lot of the same birds and bird species that live in the woods remain in these shelter wood harvests or high severity burn areas or what, whatever structure it is that has that substantially reduced forest canopy. They remain, they stay there. Um, there are a few that drop out, namely the oven bird is the one that always surfaces as being the one that doesn't like these early successional habitats. But as long as there's mature forest, you know, large patches of mature forest nearby, they'll be okay. And what comes in besides the ones that stay, which is most species, is what's called early successional or disturbance adapted breeding bird species that don't occur in the mature forest. They pretty much only occur in open areas. So you're creating habitat for these disturbance adapted species, but you're also retaining a lot of the other, almost all of the other species. So what you see is the number of species in those areas goes way up and also the number of birds per unit area, like per acre, also goes way up because birds seem to like those areas. And what, what they probably like about those areas is firstly, they, they might like the dense cover that's created by the shrubs and the saplings and things. A lot of um, bird species bring their families into those areas to forage. So you'll see a lot of family activity in those areas. And Partly it's because of that cover that protects their young and protects them, but also probably because, or some of our research has shown that um, the number of flying and foliar insects increases in those areas, probably because of the lush foliage that's regenerating after the cut, the stump sprouts, you know, a lot of the stumps that are left sprout back and they mm -hmm. become young trees. Regeneration of forests is not only through seedlings, a lot of it is through stump sprouts. Right. Um, of things come and they one one or so of those might you know outcompete the other stump sprouts. If there's 30 stump sprouts, one might eventually become a tree. So it's seedlings and stump sprouts that become the new forest. And um, 
they're all producing nut young lush leaves and that might attract insects. A lot of them are flowering and fruiting and that might attract insects. And the birds tend to come in probably for those insects as well as the cover. And another thing that I've studied in those young areas is um, native fleshy fruit production. So mm -hmm. things like blackberries and pokeweed and black cherries, even tree species produce fruits in these young stands. Blueberries, huckleberries. A lot of these young stands, because of the shrub production increases so much and because these disturbance adapted plant species like pokeweed and blackberry come in, pokeweed and blackberry tend to be quite abundant in young disturbed areas. They're called pioneer species. And so pokeweed's a pioneer species, blackberries a pioneer species, and both of them produce abundant fruit along with a lot of other things. Blueberries produce abundant fruit in young stands in particular. A lot of these also produce in mature stands, but not the pioneer species like the blackberry and the pokeweed. And what we have found, we actually did a study where we counted all the berries in, you know, like 15 stands. We counted all the berries every month for 10 years. Oh, wow. That's a lot of work. In these young stands and also all the berries every month in mature stands so we could compare. And what we found is initially the first five years or so you get, you know, five to 20 times more fruit in these young stands compared to the mature stands. It just skyrockets. And then as the stand becomes shaded in, it goes back down. So by the 10th year, there's about the same low level amount of fruit production in the young stands compared to the mature stands. But for the first five years or seven years, you get way more fruit for animals in these young stands. And that's largely due to the pioneer species like blackberry and pokeweed, but also production by a lot of other plant species. So in other words, the birds come in to these stands and there's a higher density of birds and a higher number of species of birds in young stands, partly because of the bugs, partly because of the cover and partly because of the native fleshy fruit. And if you retain oak trees in those young stands also, you will also get acorn production. So they're very, very productive sites for animals food-wise and cover-wise. Cover yeah, those young forests can be amazing with everything that you can see and find in there. Yes. And one of the nice things is I've been able to also do studies of what happens to the reptiles and amphibians. Yes. So as I mentioned before, um, not all species respond similarly. And a lot of times you don't catch enough of any one species to be able to say very much about any one species, but some species are pretty common and you can make some, a few generalizations about them. And what we've found in general is if you harvest an area or if there's a high severity burn where the canopy is substantially open, lizards generally increase because lizards, which are reptiles, thermoregulate and they it's probably because they like these warmer areas. They, you know, they may reproduce more in those areas. They may come in from, you know, the surrounding forest into those areas. I can't tell where they came from, but they're more abundant in these young stands. It could be because of the warmth. It could be because of the increase in bugs, like we just talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't tell you exactly why, but we do see that pattern. Amphibians are a little iffier. Surprisingly, one might think that amphibians would decrease when you open the canopy because amphibians have moist skin that a lot of them breathe through their skin and they have to stay moist. Um, and you'd think that if, it, if you open the canopy and it gets warmer and brighter and sunnier, they might avoid it. Yeah, at least temporarily. Temporarily, because as I said, these forests grow very quickly. So any of these effects are gonna be very short lived, seven years or, or less, I mm -hmm. would say. Um, so as long as you have surrounding woods that's mature, and as long as you're allowing forests to grow back, if you keep a mosaic of some young areas and some older areas and some mature areas, you'll probably be providing for enough habitat for most species of animals, even though they might not all occur at the same densities in the same spots on the landscape, you're keeping a variety. To me, as long as you don't build Walmarts and pave, you know, pave their habitat, it's not that important how, what the condition of the forest is, as long as you have a variety of different conditions on the landscape and enough of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's when you destroy the habitat 
completely and, and pave over it. That that's, that's where I get the most worried. <laughs> uh, but back to the amphibians, um, we have found that a lot of other studies have found that some, some kinds of terrestrial salamanders, those are salamanders that live on land mostly, and they not the creek salamanders, mm -hmm. decrease after a shelter wood harvest. And you would think that that would be the case because it is, you know, more open and warmer and stuff. And in the Shelterwood study that I did, or that me and graduate students did and other, other collaborators, most of my research is not just me. It's with a lot of partners. Oh, yes. To do what you do, I, yes, you would have to have a lot of partners and helpers. <laughs> it's very labor intensive and it really takes a village to do a good study. But we also found that salamanders decreased in shelter wood harvests um, after a delayed response. So the first year or two, we didn't see that, but eventually they did. But then they come back up because the forest is recovering. And a lot of these species are very common. So it's really not a huge concern in my mind, at least as long as, as I said, you have these other habitats around also. But um, Surprisingly, when we did a study in the high severity burn and also low severity burns, where you would also think that these salamanders might decrease, they really didn't, or it was a kind of an uncertain response. You know, they, we couldn't statistically tell for sure what they were doing, but they didn't dramatically decrease in these prescribed burned areas where the canopy remained intact or prescribed burns where it was high severity by accident, sort of. This was a fuel reduction study. They didn't really um, show a pattern of huge decrease for these terrestrial salamanders. And the frogs, surprisingly, didn't show any pattern of response at all. That could be for various reasons, but I think that in general, frogs tend to, most of them breed in wetlands. That means puddles mm -hmm. or ephemeral ponds or creeks or, you know, lakes. Right. And they're more dependent on where they're breeding. So if there's water around, they breed and then most of them come up into the woods and they don't, they seem to be a little bit oblivious as to the condition of the woods. They're just gonna come out regardless. So you see a lot of strange patterns with amphibians uh, that are frogs and toads, but a little bit more of a pattern with some of these terrestrial salamanders that didn't like the shelter woods very much. And that makes sense too, the difference between the salamanders responses in the shelter wood forests and the low intensity burn areas that you still have that closed canopy, especially because, I mean, this is deciduous forests. So you might have a short term effect on the leaf litter that's going to help to keep that moisture in. But as soon as the fall comes, you're going to have leaves on the ground again and the leaf litter is going to be there. So those moist conditions are going to come back. It's interesting that you didn't see a response or the same response in high intensity burns where you actually opened up the canopy more so you wouldn't have wouldn't have that more immediate or quicker response with bringing back the leaf litter. Yes, I was surprised and I'm not, you know, any study is just one small study. So mm -hmm. I, I, I recently read another study that I think is about to be published or maybe it has been where they did find a decrease in these in high severity wildfire areas. So it's not like 100% sure, but just because one study shows one thing, especially with wildlife, because wildlife also has its own background patterns of abundance. So there might be years where there's more and years where there are fewer. And it could be the area or it could be the elevation. It could be how that fire was, you know, actually showed up on the landscape. So it's, it's hard to make huge decrees about impacts. But I think if you get enough studies and you see enough patterns, you can generally start to see how animals are responding to various, you know, disturbances. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the things that I think is so important to understand is that a single research project that says one thing isn't necessarily the end all be all that's part of science is you've got to replicate it in different places and in, over time and stuff like that to really learn what's what are the real patterns and what are those things you just go hmm that's interesting and so much of science is not answering questions but Finding out qu more questions to ask <laughs> is a lot of what it is. 
Yes, it's pieces to the puzzle. And mm -hmm. each study adds a piece to the puzzle. And I think your comment about long-term research was, was really touche because most studies, because of how studies, how research studies are funded, mm -hmm. most of them are funded by grants and they last two years or three years. And most of them are done by graduates. Many of them are done by graduate students have, who have ephemeral projects that, you know, their thesis or their dissertation is done within a couple of years. Yeah, we don't want to stay in school for 30 years to do a long-term project. <laughs> That's right. So a lot of studies for that re for those reasons are tend to be short term. And one of the advantages I found of working for the Forest Service is we also have budget limitations, and there definitely are you know obstacles to having long term studies, uh, depending on you know the the fiscal cycles and so on. But in general, our salaries are paid over the long term, so we tend to be able to do longer term studies. And I've done several long-term studies that I think the nature of having them last for a long time has given a lot more insight than some of these shorter term studies. Oh, yes, I definitely agree. We need both. And just for our listeners to understand, like you said, a lot of the research that's done is done by graduate students or is funded by grants that last two, three years. And a lot of cases of four or five year study is considered pretty long. But for your research, a lot of it, we're talking 10 to 20 years. So it's a whole different scale that is also very important. And both are important, I think. I do too. It's, it's all the pieces added together that create knowledge. Yes. So I've done a lot of short-term studies too, but one of my studies, uh, my longer-term studies was, of course, a huge partnership. It was, technically, it was a fuels reduction study where the, the uh, main scientist was looking at how um, prescribed burning or thinning out the vegetation affects fuels. Mm -hmm. But as for most good studies, if you have a great study design with replication, like you said, you have more than one place on the landscape that you're looking, but you have several different places that are all prescribed burned and several that are all thinned out and several others that nothing is done or they serve as controls where you can see what, what happens when you do impact the landscape through silviculture compared to what happens if you leave it alone. That's a good scientific or study design because mm -hmm. um, you can do statistics on it and find out what the average responses are, not what the response is in this one spot on the landscape, which could be a freakish place. Um, so, but in many good studies, you try to get collaborators so that you not only look at what happens to the fuels, but you look at what happens to the forest regeneration process. You look at what happens to the bugs. You look at what happens to the bird communities and the reptiles and amphibians and so on. So I was lucky enough to be able to collaborate with another scientist who designed this study. It was called the fire and fire surrogate study. And uh, in that study, we were able to conduct a series of four repeated burns over a 16 year period. So we weren't just looking at one burn, we were looking at what happens if you burn many times mm -hmm. over the course of many years, which is what a lot of forest managers want to do. Most know that one prescribed burn probably won't do very much. Mm -hmm. It's the continued application of management that might have an effect. And so that was a 16 year study. And I think there's actually a few studies that are still going on there even today, which is longer than 16 years. And another long-term study I did was the acorn production study that we discussed where you can't tell much about acorn production if you just look at a couple of years because one might be a crazy good year, one might be a really bad year. One mm -hmm. might be a good year for white oaks, but a bad year for scarlet oaks. I mean, there are many species and each one has its own patterns. Right. So looking at acorn production over many years is very important to figure out sort of if you can find a pattern, but also how you could quantify production on average. If you have good years and bad years, a manager may or may not be able to quantify how many acorns his unit, his or her unit of land would produce. But if you have long-term averages, they might be able to say, hmm, I have, you know, 100 white oaks on my land that I'm managing and 50, 50 uh, scarlet oaks and 30 northern red oaks. So on average, what can I expect? Not every year because it's going to be really crazy. But on average, what can I expect my unit of land to produce if I know how many trees 
of different sizes and species there are on my unit of land. So they could actually tailor their land management scenarios to their particular unit of land and estimate how many acorns on over a long term, on average, their unit of land might produce. So that's, a, that's another long-term study that I've done. And then I've done, I was really lucky to be able to keep a long-term study going in Florida, in Florida sand hills on ephemeral wetlands. Ephemeral wetlands are small little wetlands that mm -hmm. um, dry up and fill up depending on the, the rainfall and the groundwater. The shape. season and yes, all that stuff. Yes. And so we were able for 24 years to trap reptiles and amphibians around eight different small ephemeral wetlands continually year round for 24 years. And talk about a lot of work. We had to hire someone who would go and check the traps, you know, several times a week. Right. Um, so we could tell. But by doing that, we were able to tell what uses those ponds to reproduce, what species. How often is their reproduction successful compared to not successful? What happens when the ponds dry up? Um, what might happen with climate change if rainfall patterns change or droughts increase in severity and length and duration? Mm -hmm. um, these ponds might dry up or they might fill up for very, very short periods. And many species, their, lar their larvae or their tadpoles, for example, might require months to develop before they become a baby frog and leave the wetland. Whereas others, their tadpoles might be able to develop within two weeks. So if we have climate change and there's longer or shorter periods of time when these wetlands actually have water, you might see a shift in what's able to reproduce successfully. You might see a lot more spadefoot toads who can develop in two weeks. They might be very successful, but the gopher frogs that might require months, they might not be as successful in the light of climate change. So these are the kinds of things we can find out, but only through long-term studies. Yes, and that's really interesting too, because like you said, the developmental habits of these species can vary wildly, even whereas some that tend to develop more often in those ephemeral pools, especially those spring ephemeral pools that are smaller, more short-lived they can adjust their developmental process based on what the temperatures are like, how quickly the pond is drying up. I've seen that happen some with wood frogs and some wood frog studies that I've done, but others may not be able to make those adjustments. And again, that's where those longer term, broader studies are so important. Definitely. The ones uh, I haven't done a lot of ephemeral pond work here in the southern Appalachians or in hardwoods. Most of my work has been done in the coastal plain on that topic, but a lot of the same principles apply. So here, for example, if, as you just said, if we have, you know, heavier rainfalls due to climate change or, you know, way more rain or at different seasons, or we have longer droughts and they dry up, that could affect some species but maybe not so much the ones that have more plasticity, as you just said, for the wood frogs, for example, mm -hmm. which I haven't studied, but you, as you mentioned, some of them can tweak, you know, if they know the, if they subconsciously know, or somehow their bodies detect that the wetlands are dry, drying down, they can accelerate their development a little bit, but not, there, there's only so much they can do that. Right. You can't do huge changes. You can't go from a normal five week to a one week development period or something like right. that. For the ones that some even take a year, some of the random yeah. frogs or the, you know, like bullfrogs, they might take, you know, a really long time. They may not be able to adapt. So you might see shifts in community composition of what species are able to be successful and which ones are not. Yes. So with your Florida work, because I know we've got listeners down on the coastal plain, what were some of the really interesting, cool things that you found? Well, of course, I lived here, so I have to credit the University of Florida and many, many wonderful field assistants who actually trap, you know, check the traps mm -hmm. many times a week. But uh, we found a lot of interesting things, many, many of which we've already talked about. Is um, one of the things that I find found very interesting is the conditions in a pond might seem perfect for a certain species, like maybe the water lasts for months and it's perfect for gopher frog, for example, mm -hmm. as one of many species that we caught. We caught dozens and dozens of species of animals for 24 years. But um, 
the conditions might seem to be perfect in eight different ponds, but and they the adults might come in and actually breed in only a subset of those ponds. Why they're not breeding in all of them, it's hard to know. And if they breed in a subset of the ponds, young or juveniles might actually successfully develop and emerge from maybe none of those ponds or maybe one of those ponds out of eight. So just because the conditions look good, I have learned also does not mean that they're gonna successfully reproduce. There are a lot of things going on under the water, which I didn't, I wasn't able to tell what it was, but it could be underwater predation by, there's a lot of bugs or some kinds of larval insects that eat tadpoles or sometimes they eat each other or sometimes there are too many and maybe they just don't survive, maybe there's diseases, but there are a lot of things going on. So just because a species breeds in a pond, which they may or may not, even if it looks good to mm -hmm. me, it doesn't may not look good to them or maybe they're not present um, that year. Uh, just because they breed does not mean they're gonna successfully have young. So I think one of their strategies we've learned is to just gamble and try to breed as much as they can in as many ponds and they might have a little bit of success. The other thing is that sometimes thousands of young emerge from a tiny little pond for one species. So maybe thousands emerge in one pond and none in another. So it's, and probably most of those young that emerge get eaten immediately by the snakes that are lurking around and other things that eat, eat these babies mm -hmm. coming out. It's, it's a great place to hang out and find food if, if you're a predator, because all these babies are coming out at once, baby <laughs> frogs. So there's a lot of crazy, erratic, unpredictable dynamics going on which is one reason um, if landowners have these ephemeral ponds, it's really important to leave them mm -hmm. and leave as many of them as you can. Uh, because as I said, some may be productive some years and others not so much, but by having a lot of them scattered about the landscape, you might be able to sustain populations of a lot of different kinds of amphibian species. Right. And it's, a lot more going on, like you said there, than just the amphibian species in those ephemeral ponds. I mean, you've got dragonfly larvae and fairy shrimps and all kinds of really awesome, cool critters. And it's a fun ecosystem to really play around in and explore. And in fact, in one of our early podcast episodes, we talked a lot about ephemeral pools and how to create them and maintain them and on your property and their importance. So they're awesome. I love ephemeral pools. I used to not. I used to just think it was just like a mud spot that never really went away and during the rainy season. But now I've come to realize over the last several decades just how important they are and how much fun they are to explore. And it sounds like in some ways the amphibian population, um, especially the frogs coming out of them, it's kind of like acorns and the boom and bust and different seasonalities and it changes from one year to the next. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good way to put it because it's really true. It's very erratic and a year might be great for one species, but not another. We have, um, we have striped newts. We have more than just frogs. We have striped newts and we have aquatic reptiles like swamp snakes and, and mud turtles and things that also use these puns. But you're right. It's, I think a lot of amphibians in particular just kind of use that gambling strategy where they know that they may not be successful sometimes for years in a row. And they, they know that in, they may be able to reproduce successfully in some ponds, um, but not others. And they know that a lot of their babies might get eaten. So it's kind of like an all or none strategy. They try as much as they can and maybe some of their young will escape. Now, when I say they know it, I don't really mean they're cognitively thinking about it, but somehow their evolutionary strategy has learned how to um, gamble and try really hard in a lot of places. And maybe some of them will survive to perpetuate their species into the future in that location. Right. And it's not even an individual. We're not talking about individual knowledge or cognizant either. We're talking as the species as a whole and the population in that location as well. Um, yeah, I know we all do that a lot. We tend to use no, and it's not knowing as the same in any form, like what we know things. No, it's probably all, to, all these uh, strategies for reproducing successfully or making sure your genes go into the next generation. 
have evolved over time. And the ones that were able to do it through this gambling strategy and enough of them, their young were able to survive to continue their species. Those strategies worked. So that became sort of imbued into their strategy of how they're sort of, you know, wired now to reproduce. Right. So let's see. We've talked about your acorn work and we've talked about your breeding songbird research and reptiles and amphibians. You've also done some studies with your colleagues as well about some of the insects, correct? And their usage of oak hardwood forest systems. Yes, most of my insect studies have been opportunistic, um, meaning I was trapping reptiles and amphibians and I had these bucket traps out and a lot of bugs fell into them. So I went ahead and collected the bugs, but by no means am I an entomologist. I worked with other specialists to identify them and we quantified you know, what the response was in terms of how many there are in young stands compared to mature stands. Mm -hmm. But I was not the, the expert in the bugs, but some of the general things that we have found mutually um, were, as I said before, um, in these young stands, there tend to be a lot more flying and foliar insects initially, probably because of the lush foliage and the flowering that's happening as the canopy opens. Mm -hmm. Pollinators come in, things that want to eat the young leaves come in, and, so, and therefore there are a lot of bugs in that strata. But probably also the ones on the ground, the ones that live on the ground, when the leaf litter is disturbed by machinery or burning, there isn't as much moisture initially, even though, as you already mentioned, it's in hardwood forests, it's, the leaf litters replenish very quickly because the next fall, all these leaves drop from the trees and then there's leaf litter again. So it's very ephemeral. But uh, a lot of the bugs that live on the ground, as a general rule, they might decrease temporarily. So it really depends on where you're talking about and what kinds of bugs. But I would not profess to be a bug expert. <laughs> So for that, you might have to ask somebody else. <laughs> yes, but I love that too, because it just shows that curiosity. You've got the bugs and it's like, oh, cool. Let me do something with them. And, and it just leads you to other areas and you may not have the answers yourself, but you know people to go to and say, help, because this looks interesting. What can we learn from here? Rather than just ignoring and saying, that's not what we're looking at. So I'm, eh toss out the bugs and keep going. Uh, that's just, to me, that's something that's always been part of me too. So I'm like, I'll just start out looking at one thing. I was like, Ooh, what's that? And, and that insatiable curiosity that just leads you to keep wanting to learn as much as you can about everything. It is a, it's great to have curiosity and it's wonderful to have collaborators and partners who are experts. But as I mentioned before, you can't capitalize on everything because all of these scientific studies are expensive. They take a lot of people to check the traps. They take a lot of people to install the traps, which is massive, hard work. You got to have all the young grad students do that and the helpers. <laughs> mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of work and a lot of people to put in traps and check traps. And if you're doing tree studies, you got to go back and remeasure them. And it takes a lot of time. So the huge overhead is hiring people. And then if you're doing a bug study, for example, you got to hire people to count them and identify them in the lab. Mm -hmm. If you're doing an acorn study, you got to hire people to count the acorns and weigh them. If you're doing a fleshy fruit study, you got to figure out how much biomass is produced in the lab and have people count every fruit for months. So all of this takes a lot of money. And it's one, one reason that multiple aspects of studies that are well-designed can't be addressed is because you just don't have the funding. But if you can, and you have good cooperators and maybe a minimal amount of money, it's great to expand on the work that's already been done to get that study in place mm -hmm. and get those animals trapped and so on and so forth. Yes. And I think that is important to bring up is that behind the scenes part of the science and the research that most of us don't see or don't see on an everyday basis. That is that finding the people to actually do the work, finding the people that know how to identify every single little insect um, and nobody can identify every single little insect. So you've got multiple people there, but being able to find the people to do all the work, whether that's the counting or the identifying, 
the checking the traps. There's just so much that goes into research behind the scenes. It's very labor intensive and financially intensive as well. Yes, it definitely is. That um, That's one of the reasons why we don't know a lot more, but it's also uh, one of the great reasons to, you know, fund long-term research if possible and to fund multidisciplinary research where you do have experts from many different fields coming in to work together because you can learn a lot from one study if you have all these different aspects going on at the same time. Yeah, science, like everything else, it's, it's complicated. There aren't simple answers for how to do a lot of this. That's true. So you've done so, so much work on so many different topics. What are some of the key takeaways or applications, or do you have any for the ways that we as landowners might be able to apply some of what you've found? Well, I think probably the biggest thing is for landowners to develop what their goals are, because Mm -hmm. whatever your goals are is going to affect what you want to do. If you want oven birds, then you should have plenty of mature forest, for example, because they don't like the open areas. If you want higher diversity of birds and many of the disturbance dependent species like indigo buntings, chestnut sided warblers, if you're at a higher elevation because they occur higher, eastern towhees and various other things, then you might want to open up your forest canopy. If you open up the forest canopy, you might want to leave some mature woods around too so you can have more things on your whole piece of property, even if they're not all in exactly the same spot. (laughs) Uh, If you open up the canopy enough, you're going to also get a lot more fleshy fruit production and a lot more plants that come in and flower initially until that stand grows up because nothing is static in nature. Everything is constantly changing in nature. But initially, you might have a lot more flowers and you might attract a lot of pollinators. So you don't really need to plant if you're a landowner unless you want specific things like monarch butterflies who only like milkweed and I'm not a monarch expert, but from what I've read, you might want to plant some milkweed or this and that. But if you have woods and if you open it up, you're going to get a lot of native flowering and foliage and cover and all kinds of things that will attract insects and birds. So you don't really have to do a lot of planting. You can just open up your canopy. Yeah, I like that. And I'm glad you brought up the goals too, and knowing your goals, because like I said, there's not one generic answer. You really need to drill down a little bit more with your goals and are there specific species that you're looking at or groups of organisms? So those more closed, mature forest versus having some of those more open, early successional species. Well, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we wrap up? I think we've covered a whole lot. So, and landowners can feel free to contact me through email. Okay, thanks. I'll put your email address in the show notes as well so people can easily get to it. Okay. Um, One thing to note is I'm a research ecologist. I'm not a land manager. There are people who apply a lot of these concepts and know a whole lot about what to do actually on the ground with the tractors and with the prescribed burning and how to do the burning and what methods to use. I don't do that. I'm not a manager. I, what I try to do is to provide information and knowledge from research to the land managers, and then they can use that depending on what, what their particular goals are. Right. Again, it takes a village. I mean, it takes the researchers that can research and learn the knowledge. It takes the managers that can actually apply the knowledge. I mean, it takes so many different, so many different people to really make any of this work. Yes. Yeah, this has been awesome. I've learned so much. Thank you. And I will have also in the show notes, a link to some of the summaries of your research that have been written more for the public. I know the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station has what they call the Compass Live articles, where they really summarize without having to dig into the actual scientific journal articles, which is, which is nice. I mean, I can read the journal articles, but Sometimes it's just nice to read the summaries as well. So absolutely. Yes. The journal articles can get very tedious. They're very technical. Oh, yes, exactly. So I'll have a link to all of your research that's been made into those Compass Live articles, those summaries available as well. Um, I'll have a link in the show notes for any of our listeners who want to learn a little bit more. 
about some of the stuff that you've done as well. That sounds great. I also have, um, uh, I've co-edited three books now with other people on oh. one on early successional habitat. Uh, I actually hate that term. One on young forest, forest conditions. <laughs> Another one on natural disturbances, and a third one is about to come out on fire, fire ecology across the whole U.S. Very interesting. And these are chapters that were written by experts in their various topic areas. So I didn't write every chapter of all these books, but I, I and my co-editors synthesized them. And I could probably send you some links to that. Please, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. And I'll have those in the show notes as well for everybody. Okay. But yeah, thanks again. This has been awesome. Great. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, have a great day. You too, Shannon. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. I appreciate Katie taking time to talk with us. Long-term research and collaborative research that looks at many different taxa like she has done is vitally important to helping us have a richer and deeper understanding of our local ecosystems. I find her research particularly interesting, given that many of our forests either are or have historically been oak hickory forests. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know that I also write a weekly backyard ecology blog. If you are enjoying these podcast episodes, then you might also want to check out my blog. The easiest way to find my blog is to visit my website at www.backyardecology.com net slash blog. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.